I have to disagree with Jill on two points before I start the discussion of the paper. Uh, the first point is I think that for the economists in the crowd, the fact that there are no formulas here is actually more difficult for an after lunch paper than uh, a legal paper. And the second point is that I actually really like the fact that this is an early stage paper. Usually when you get to comment on a paper that has been workshopped around, it's very difficult to find uh, uh, comments here. Since this is a, a very first draft, uh, there are many ideas uh, in the paper. There are many uh, thoughts that one could bring to the table. So this paper is uh, an attempt to offer some new conceptual framework uh, uh, for us to understand uh, the new landscape in corporate governance. Um, there's the old theory that focused on agency cost. Now we have a new reality that calls for a new theory about collaboration. Uh, the old theory uh, was about allocation of power between managers and shareholders, or more uh, specifically about the fight over who should get the power. The new theory, and this is you know, uh, uh, my attempt to summarize the paper, Pepper has a very complex uh, uh, line of argument. It starts with a positive account about the fact that we live in a more uh, friendly uh, environment than in the past. Then it makes the claim that collaboration actually enhances firm value because of you know, complementary information sharing. Then it uses cooperative game theory to explain how should one structure cooperation between the parties. Then it talks about implications for corporate law. And I think one of the, the, the major uh, comments that I have going forward is, you know, should all these uh, theories be in one single uh, paper? Because each one of them is novel in its own account and, and requires a, a, a lot of effort to explain and to convince the reader. But eventually it all boils down to the power, the allocation of power between shareholders and, and, and insiders should be tied to their informational input. Uh, and I have comments or questions uh, about the positive accounts and, and some comments and questions about uh, the normative account. Uh, is it really that we don't have uh, conflict <coughs> anymore? Uh, uh, is it really about the value of information? Uh, and then should we really try and tie the value of collaboration to the allocation of power between insiders and uh, shareholders? Uh, so let's start with the claim that, well, now it's less confrontational. Well, first, those proxy fights that do exist, you know, if you read the press releases, they're not the friendliest uh, type of, of statements. Moreover, you know, I uh, grew up in a neighborhood where we engaged in many fights. Uh, and one of the things that you learn, or maybe I learned because I was uh, thinking about that, although I, I did fight a lot, is that you never fight with someone when you know what the outcome is going to be, right? Because then you're stupid, right? You fight. Unless you're winning. <laughs> no, but then, you know, you fight when there's some uncertainty over the outcome. And maybe, maybe what we see here, it's not that, you know, the power, the allocation of power doesn't really matter. Is that, well, at least today, because of uh, the reconcentration of power with institutional shareholders, it's, it's pretty clear in many of these cases the shareholders will get their way. And maybe, maybe we should also be focusing more, and I'll get to that later on, about the implications of the paper for uh, CEO versus uh, boards. Uh, and again, I'll get back to that uh, later on. One point about the value of, of information sharing, uh, I found it interesting that one of the claims in the paper is that, uh, as Jill said, it's not claim about history, but now it's more about information and, and, and new economy firms. How do you reconcile that with the fact that some of the new economy firms like Facebook, Google, and others are the ones where founders insist on having dual class talk, does it mean that they don't care about uh, information and information gathering and so on and so forth? This is just a, a small point to think about when presenting this argument. Another point, and Jill uh, 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 addressed it in her comments, but should be further developed in the paper, is the difference between hedge funds and mutual funds when it comes to uh, information that each one of them uh, has or, sh or uh, you know, could have uh, with you know, different regulatory uh, limitations. Um, the thing 
the thing that I found to be most intriguing and raises question here is, is the implications that the paper tries to draw from the notion that we have some form of collaboration that may be value enhancing for how we should structure uh, decision making rights. So they talk in the paper about one guiding principle for how you decide how should you allocate decision making rights. Decision making rights should be allocated according to the marginal contribution of each party's informational inputs and that's why you know part of the claims here are you know because investors have more uh, uh, informational value these days maybe uh, they should get uh, more input. Uh, they also make the point that in practice in most cases normally it's the board uh, that has uh, a lot to uh, add in terms of informational value unless the company is underperforming and given given these uh, uh, <coughs> uh, starting points they try to offer a, a new way to allocate decision making power between shareholders and the board uh, and I'm going to focus on the rules of the game decision for uh, uh, Julian, I'm, 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 I know that there are other people here for you. It's like it's one of the differences between the UK system and the you know US system. In the UK, shareholders can unilaterally change the charter. In the under Delaware law, you need to have both uh, uh, boards and uh, shareholders in order to make a decision. Uh, so they make a, a, a suggestion that most rules of the game decisions should be in the charter. That means typically. Uh, both board input and shareholder input with some arrangements to take account of the fact that the IPO market is imperfect. Now, this is one question that, that I had and you answered it in your paper. You know, if, if let's assume that we all agree on the collaborative model. We know that uh, the board could sometimes be the best uh, 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 from a position, the best, and the, the board is, or insiders are the one with the best information about the company, sometimes it's shareholders. Why do we need to change the rules of the game, right? Presumably, shareholders, shareholders would make an ad hoc decision whether they go with the board or whether we go with some activist shareholders or someone else. And in fact, in the paper and in the presentation here, the argument for having some form of board veto is that you have some spe speculative investor interventions, that's how we defined in the paper and in the presentation, Jill presented it as short-term uh, investors. In other words, you know, we start with a model that says, you know, we don't care about agency costs anymore, it's all about collaboration, and then we end with a model that says, look, there are two types of agency costs. We need to, when we make power, uh, when we make decisions about how do we allocate power, we get back to this agency cost and we add uh, speculative investor interventions. And again, if, if you don't buy, if you're not convinced by the speculative investor interventions argument, then you end up with just shareholder power uh, 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 as, as Lucian uh, 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 likes it to be. And the second point, and that's a more legally, uh, that's a more legal point, if you really believe in the IPO amendments that say, well, it's going to be some sunsetting or it's going to be some form of, of you know, limited shareholder, not limited, shareholder power to unravel uh, arrangements that were decided at the IPO stage, then again, we all, it all boils down to shareholder power and we end up with shareholders being the ones making the decision, which again questions questions the, the importance of insisting on a board veto uh, even within your own framework. So what do I think, what do I think, you know, some things to think about. I read the paper, I found the col collaborative model to be quite interesting. I think it, it actually describes what's happening in many of the companies where you have activist directors being appointed to the board. Um, I'm not sure, or at least I think the paper could be uh, 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 written in a way to make it more convincing that it necessarily says something about boards versus shareholders, or board versus shareholder power. Maybe it says something about how we should think about the role of the board of directors in intermediating knowledge, you know, the links between CEOs and knowledgeable investors. And maybe, 
It should be more about uh, the second part of your implications about mechanisms to facilitate collaboration given uh, the allocation of power. And again, the legal treatment of activist settlements, uh, uh, constituency directors, uh, and other legal questions that arise uh, uh, where today it's very difficult to explain, uh, it's very difficult to explain uh, uh, some of what we see uh, without having a good theory of Look, there's value in this communication between shareholders, boards, and, and the CEOs. Uh, thank you very much. So, Jill, you are not really suggesting a board-centered model of shareholder power, right? Right. Um, along the lines of uh, Bainbridge or Lynn Stout. You're actually probably closer to Lucian than you are to them, so I have to guess. <laughs> That's probably um, one, one of the key questions for you to decide what you think about is, should shareholders be able to amend the charter unilaterally? Should they be able to say, you know what, we decided on this rule, we want to change it. Um, what would be the downside of that? Because that's the rule in much of the world, right? And if there are disasters from that rule, I'm not aware of them, right? Um, but that's, a, that's an area where the U.S. differs from many other countries. We don't let the shareholders propose charter amendments. It has to start from the board, um, which makes it much harder for the, sh for the, the shareholders to change charter. Um, that's just a question. <coughs> I think the main prob problem is collaboration between the board board also brings information to, to the management and, um, and all the dynamics between the board and management may influence the company very much. If you take an anti-position, like you are a corporate governance guy and everything they bring, you think they are going to, to make you something wrong, okay? They have some in the back of the mind, okay? Uh, so that would paralyze the board. I think, I think this is a very delicate uh, balance. And the main problem first, before shareholders management, is board management relations, is a plus, is a collaboration, is a sharing information. A lot of times they don't share information. They don't want to share information with the board because the board is uh, is going to be uh, against them, or going to make it out, or going to kind of undermine their, uh, their position. So I would start with the board management collaboration and then see if, as a second layer, shareholder collaboration can happen. Okay, yeah, good question. I'm, I'm not sure about the term collaborative. I mean, I think. Ever since we put a prohibition on slavery, everything in a market is voluntary, right? And so if you look at agency, particularly the original Jensen Meckling, I mean, it was a voluntary exchange. You would hire somebody, but you would recognize that their objectives were somewhat different than yours. And so I guess the first thing is, do you recognize or do you acknowledge that managers in some dimensions may have different objectives than shareholders. It, does that, to the extent that you think there is that difference, you probably want to give more power to shareholders. If you don't think there's much of a conflict, then you get less. Then there's the information. If you think that the shareholders have information that's valuable, you probably want to have them more involved in the decision making. And in fact, Mike and Bill have worked on that and who has the specific knowledge. And the last thing, if you want to put something else into the mix, is that I guess Oliver Hart and Luigi Zingales have a paper where that they're saying that shareholders can have a different objective function. It's not maximizing the stock price, it's whatever else they're doing. If you believe that that's great, you'd probably want to involve shareholders more in the decision making process. If you think that that's, that objective function should be the firm's objective function. I mean, that, you know, that in part, there's a question of whether you characterize that as shareholder self-dealing or a legitimate way of defining the firm's objectives. Whatever, but right. I mean, to the extent that, 
so again, I'm not sure about the word collaborative because I think a market arrangement has to be collaborative once you've got a lot of stuff. Which we have. So, anyways. So, and it seems to me that the level of shareholder involvement, how much you want them involved, is whether you think things like agency is a big problem or a small one. You know, I think Lucian has a view, and I'm pretty close to but other people are far from that. Um, and the information differences, and maybe the objective differences. So, I don't know if you've worked that you. I've seen somebody very in the Okay. Lucian. Happy to hear that Jim, you are closer to the music people I have than the other side. Let's see whether uh, maybe the comment can give you the excellent part in the direction. One is, I think that the, the shoulder power view is not, I think, one that is in any way in tension with collaboration and friendliness and so forth. It just means that to have the best collaboration, it's good to have as a background one in which the shareholders have the powers. So for example, when Lord Langfine works with the head of a division, he would say, we collaborate, we go on trips, we work 18 hours a day together, we collaborate, we sing together. But in that relationship, Lord Langfine keeps the power and doesn't give the number four Besides veto powers of, of any kind. So the question is more whether the collaboration would be best functioning against the background in which there is joint power or power for the so called principle. The second comment is there's also I'm not sure as much a tension between having, you know, both sides have information. You have the intuition, which is interesting, that if both sides have information, <coughs> then both sides should have some of the power. I'm sorry. Then both sides should have some of the decision making power. Right. Now, this is why it's much bigger than the corporate context, because you can say it about the basic principal agent problem. So, in the standard formulation of the principal agent problem, the goal is it's fundamental to it that the agent has the information that the principal doesn't have. But in all the standard works, and in most of the context where we have principal agents, leads to all kinds of complicated problems and contracts and so forth, but it usually doesn't involve giving the agent veto rights and joint decision making power in the decision. So the question is what is special in the corporate context? Yeah, yeah, that's all. Okay, let's do some. Ah, okay. Welcome. Yeah, so let me try and ask the question I was maybe thinking Cliff would ask, but it is nice. So you presented a model of delegation of power uh, of shareholders to the board, more or less delegation. And you talk about collaboration. Now that's quite different because I understand the delegation because if you delegate a lot, because the shareholders don't take those decisions and they delegate less, they retain decision rights. But that doesn't require any collaboration. Correct. And they don't collaborate on class one votes, they just retain the right to decide. But they have to give you the right information and the right to decide. So what's different between your view and what you're doing? So what's different about our view is that there's actually a delivery process. The shareholders are not simply uh, uh, electing representatives and delegating certain decisions to them, but they're playing a role in the formulation of that's why the specific examples of the information sharing in a shareholder director exchange or the information sharing in the context of an activist campaign, right? There's an actual, they're bringing the discussion to the table and then jointly, as a result of that, agreeing on the operational decisions that the firm's going to make. So it would be that management proposes something and then shareholders have a veto, right? No, they no. discuss it. They just discuss it, they can't veto it. It's not. They have to make this agree. Yeah. They have to cope with it. If everyone agreed all the time, there would be no problems, right? No, no, but the, but the, point, the point is that, at least in the standard model of the U.S. firm, there isn't any way for the shareholders to bring that information, that operational information, into the boardroom, into the discussion. So if you think about the um, successful activist that gets 
hedge fund rep, uh, rep, you know, board representation, right? They've got a minority stake on the board. The fact that they've won the election contest, if you put it in, you know, contest terms, doesn't mean that they now control board decision making. But having a seat at the table allows them to bring their information and integrate that information with the board's discussions in a way that they hope is going to change the firm's, uh, you know, future operating costs. Right, that's what's distinctive about it. So it isn't that the shareholders are getting some sort of veto power or that in the absence of that, the board's going and to decide on its own. It's actually a joint decision making. So they get the private number of the CEO making the call in the row. What if, what, if, what if they disagree? Still, I don't think it's like this. Yeah. Um, so in some sense, that information transfer process does happen through media. You know, the people write new something. They, they can write the things that they want from them. And then what they will Well, that's, that's absolutely possible. But of course, it's going to be a much less efficient mechanism, among other things, to the extent that you've got shareholders who have invested in developing specialized information, they have a business plan that's actually private information, right? The publishing is not going to be the same kind of thing. They're not going to make the investment. 